So brothers and sisters, please open up your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. The book of Genesis in Hebrew is Bereshit. Bereshit, it literally means in the beginning. How the book of Genesis starts, in the beginning. So this is part one of the Logo series, a series on the Word of God. A three-part series on the Word of God. This is part one, the Logo series, the Word of God. Genesis chapter 3. So this is the first ever sin, the fall of mankind. I'm going to see how the devil managed to do it. How did he get Eve to fall? He used four very simple words. He used them against Eve, and guess what? He uses them against you and I every single day, brothers and sisters. He uses them against you and I just as he used them against Eve. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go back quickly and just look at Genesis chapter 2 from verses 15 to 17 just to get a bit of the context of the commandment of God here. He gave Adam and Eve a very simple command and that's found in Genesis chapter 2 verses 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, the rest of chapter 2 then goes on to tell us about the creation of Eve. Eve hadn't been created at this point. The commandment was given to Adam. And then Eve was created. And then at the end of chapter 2, this is when biblical marriage was instituted. A man shall leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is what Jesus quoted in Matthew 19.5. Paul also quoted this in Ephesians 5.31. Notice as well that it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. So Genesis chapter 3, going from verses 1 to 7. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that she was pleasant, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So this is the same tactic that the devil uses every single time to get you to doubt the word of God. Did God really say? Eve listened to the voice of the devil, and she doubted the word of God. The commandment was given, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Along comes the serpent. Did God really say that? This is exactly what he does with you and I, brothers and sisters. Then in verse 4, he goes a step further and he says to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Now this is exactly what we see in Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah 14, this is the origin of Satan. He has a, that typical straightforward meaning plus the deep, deeper spiritual meaning as well. The straightforward meaning is this is talking about the king of Babylon. But it has that deeper spiritual meaning in that it's pointing to Satan. Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's exactly what Satan told Eve. You can be just like God. Now, who did God give the commandment to? He gave it to Adam. Eve hadn't been created yet. He gave the commandment to Adam. And that means that the only possibility is that Adam had to pass that commandment down to Eve. It was Adam who then passed on that commandment to Eve, because Eve said, God has already said that we are not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was Adam who passed on this commandment. It's exactly what we do. We pass on the commandment of God to others, don't we? 
God commanded Adam to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and passed that commandment on to Eve. Eve then disobeyed this commandment. But then who did God confront? He confronted Adam, didn't he? Adam tried to blame Eve. He even tried to blame God. He said, it's the woman you gave me. It's not my fault. It's the woman that you gave me. He tried to shift the blame away. However, it was Adam who God was talking to. It was Adam who God confronted. So what this tells us is, husbands, that the buck stops with you, doesn't it? So be careful, husbands. The buck stops with you. Every time a believer doubts the word of God, it starts with that voice, doesn't it? It starts with those four words. Did God really say? The word of God says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. The word of God says, whoever is in Christ is a new creation, as Tony told us. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Then along comes the serpent. Did God really say that? I don't feel born again. I don't feel like a new creation. Well, the word of God says, whoever is born again is a child of God. The word of God says there is no condemnation for anyone who belongs to Jesus Christ. But I don't feel like a new creation. I don't feel born again. I don't feel like I'm free from condemnation. The only possibility is is that your feelings are wrong because the word of God isn't. The word of God is not wrong. If we believe that the word of God is 100% truth, then that means your own feelings are wrong. Your own feelings are wrong. The worst thing you can do is to follow your own feelings and your own emotions. That's how people trip up. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says that the human heart is wicked and deceptive. Who can know it? Following your own heart, following your own feelings, following your own emotions, this is the biggest mistake you can make. This is why people make bad decisions. I feel led to do this, I feel led to do that. It's not God leading you, it's your own emotions, it's your own feelings. How many times have we seen people do this? So you can either believe your own feelings or you can believe the word of God. One of them's wrong, and it's not the Word of God, because the Word of God is 100% truth, isn't it? If we believe that the Word of God is 100% truth, the only possibility that means is that your own feelings are wrong. Now, one who doubted the Word of God was Abraham. Abraham was given a very simple word from the Lord. Turn to Genesis 15. Go forward to now to Genesis 15. Genesis 15 from verses 1 to 6. This is the word that came to Abraham. Again, the word, we know that Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word, the word became flesh. Genesis 15, 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. His name was Abraham at this point. It wasn't changed to Abraham, so his name was Abraham at this point. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. He was uh, the senior servant of the household of Abraham. Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall be your heir. But the one who came from your own body shall be your heir. So in other words, you are going to have a son who shall be the heir of your estate. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven, count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted him to righteousness. So God is promising here Abraham a child through which all his descendants will come. And Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now go forward to chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. This is now where Abraham doubts the word of God that was given to him. Genesis 16, from verses 1 to 4. Now Sarai, again Sarai, that was Sarah, her name hadn't been changed to Sarah yet. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, Now see, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. So Sarah is saying here, I haven't had any children. Take my maid and have a child with her, that I might have a child through her. 
Then Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And after Abraham had dwelt in ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when he saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. But look at um, verse 3. Abraham, beg your pardon, it's verse 2. Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. He listened to his wife instead of the word of God that was given to him. He was given this word by the Lord that you shall have a son and through him your descendants will come. But then Sarah says, I go childless, therefore have a child with my servant, with my maid Hagar. So Abraham doubted the word of God that was given to him. And then he went and had a child with Hagar, who was Ishmael, the illegitimate child that we spoke about last week. The descendants of Ishmael are now those Arab Muslims who are committed to wiping Israel off the map. Israel are now suffering the consequences of Abraham's sin still to this very day. Abraham's sin, just like any other sin, had consequences. So we see that listening to the voice of the serpent and doubting the word of God always leads to disobedience. It always leads to disobedience, doesn't it? Every time a believer disobeys the word of God, every time a believer goes astray, it starts with the voice of the serpent. Did God really say? Did God really say that? It puts that doubt in their minds and that's what leads to dis disobedience. That's what leads to the going astray. That's what leads to doubting the word of God by listening to those four words. Did God really say? Now the Bible says that the way to life is narrow. The way to life is narrow. It's not just the gate which is narrow, it's also the way. And people are always trying to broaden the narrow way, aren't they? They're always trying to make that narrow way as broad as they can. Now the Bible forbids believers to marry non-believers. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 15, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? There you go. The Bible forbids believers to marry non-believers. Along comes the serpent. Did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? Is that really what he said? Surely it's okay for me to marry a non-believer. I'll just get them saved afterwards. I'll just tell them about Jesus afterwards and I'll get them saved so I can marry them. Now some believers have sadly lost loved ones who didn't know the Lord, who weren't saved. And they have to face the reality about what the Bible says about what happens to those who are not in the Lord, who die without knowing Jesus. Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11 tells us that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night. Jesus said in Mark 9, the lake of fire where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. But then along comes the serpent. Did God really say that? Is that really true? And that's why we have these false doctrines like annihilationism. Annihilationism is this idea that people don't really, they don't really suffer in hell for eternity. They just die spiritually and then they just, that's it, they, they, they go, they're dead. Well, Satan even goes a step further. Satan raises up people like Rob Bell, deceivers like Rob Bell, to say that God doesn't send anyone to hell. Rob Bell teaches that no one goes to hell. God is such a God of love that he would never send anyone to hell. Basically, Rob Bell teaches that you don't need Jesus to be saved. That's what Rob Bell teaches. That man is a deceiver. He teaches that you don't need Jesus to be saved. Because the serpent said, did God really say that? Doubting the word of God. Doubting the truth of the word of God. You ready for some real controversy now? So real controversy, Leviticus 18, verse 22. A man shall not have sex with a man, it is an abomination. What part of that verse don't people understand? Isn't that just a simple verse that even a five-year-old child can understand? Leviticus 20, 13. If a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Oh yeah, but that's the Old Testament, that's Old Testament law. You want to hear what the New Testament says? You want to know what the New Testament says? Romans 1, 24 to 28. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonour their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served 
the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the, uh, the natural use of the woman, burned in lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with men, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which ought not to be done. How clear is that? It doesn't take an intellect to understand what this is talking about, does it? But then along comes the serpent. Ah, oh, but God, did, did God really say that? Is that really what God meant? So Satan raises up deceivers like Colby Martin and Steve Chalk to tell us that God loves these relationships, that God blesses same-sex marriage. The two most common arguments you'll hear is that this is talking about male prostitutes, even though it doesn't actually mention anything about that whatsoever. And then it's talking about pedestry, something called pedestry, which is basically men who abuse boys. They say this is what this is talking about. Now, it doesn't actually mention anything about this whatsoever. It simply says, a man shall not lie with a man. That's a very simple black and white commandment, isn't it? The Greek word there for homosexual in the Bible is asnokoite. Asnokoite, it literally means a man who has sex with a man. It's not talking about pedestry, it's not talking about boys, it's not talking about male prostitutes. What did it say in Romans 1? Men committed shameful acts with men. It's not talking about boys, it's talking about men who have sex with men. Now I've got a friend in Canada who once who asked me about what the Bible says about homosexuality. So I was very happy to give her an answer. I said the Bible condemns this. I said these things are an abomination to God. God doesn't hate the sinner, but he hates the sin. He hates the sin in our life, whatever that sin is. And homosexuality is a perverse sin which God finds detestable. Her answer was, oh, but that sounds very judgmental. You're being very judgmental. She's confusing God's judgment with man's judgment. I didn't write these instructions in God's word. These words do not come from me. Do not shoot the messenger. She's confusing God's judgment and man's judgment. If it's written in God's word, it's God's judgment, not mine or yours. A short time after this, she contacts me and says, I'm very upset. I said, why? She says, well, some guy told me that me and my son are both going to hell. I said, oh dear, why did he tell you that? She said, well, it's because my son's left-handed and I raised him left-handed and because of that, apparently we're both going to hell. I said, I'm glad that's happened to you. I'm really glad that's happened to you. Do you know why? Because now you know the difference between man's judgment and God's judgment. The word of God is not confusing. The word of God is not black, is not um, unclear. The word of God is not confusing. It's people who doubt the word of God who bring the confusion. It's people who question the word of God who bring the confusion, isn't it? It's those who have listened to the voice of the serpent. Did God really say? Oh, you're being judgmental. Love is love. God blesses all relationships. I can marry a non-believer. I'll just convert them afterwards. I can have sex outside of marriage. We're in love. As long as we're in love, it doesn't matter. I can hang out with unsaved friends. I can drink the cup of the Lord and drink the cup of demons at the same time. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 to 21. The things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Why are there so many believers who think they can drink the cup of demons and drink the cup of the Lord? Why are there so many believers who think they can partake in the Lord's table and partake in the devil's table as well? They are always trying to broaden the narrow way. Why are they trying to broaden the narrow way? Because they listen to the voice of the serpent. Did God really say these things? So brothers and sisters, do not allow the devil to make you doubt the word of God. Whether you like what you read in it or not. A lot of people don't like what they read in the Bible. Doesn't make it not true. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verses 6 to 8 says, He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For such a man should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is what is the result of being double-minded and doubting. The Bible says in James, it makes you unstable in all of your ways. I used to be like this myself once. 
Why is there so much instability in the lives of believers? Because they don't believe God. They don't believe his words. It's not just about believing in God. It's not just about believing in Christ. It's about believing God. You don't just believe in God, but you believe God. You don't just believe in Christ, but you believe Christ. You believe his words. You know what James chapter 2 says about this? James chapter 2 verse 19. You believe in God, do you? So what? So do demons. Demons believe in God and tremble. It's not about believing in God. It's about believing God. It's about believing his words. Jesus didn't just say, believe in me. He said, follow me. Pick up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. Lots of people claim to believe in Jesus. We get this a lot in our evangelism. Lots of people claim to believe in Jesus, but they don't follow him. Lots of people say they believe, but they don't reject his words. They say they believe in Christ, but they reject what he said. Did God really say? Now in Luke 16, we see an interesting story here from Christ, talking about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man went down into Hades. Lazarus was comforted in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man was being tormented in Hades, wasn't he? And he said, let me go back to my brothers. I've got five brothers. Let me go back and warn them about this place. What did Abraham say? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Ah, oh, but if I come back and tell them, then surely then they'll repent. Abraham says, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, then they won't even believe, even if one comes back from the dead. A prophecy of the resurrection there. So in other words, what he's saying is, if they're not convinced by the word of God, they won't be convinced by anything. If you don't believe the word of God, you won't believe, even if someone comes back from the dead. That's exactly what Jesus did. He came back from the dead and they still didn't believe. Why didn't they believe? Because they rejected the word of God. It's not that the Jewish people rejected Christ. It's that they didn't believe Daniel. They didn't believe Zechariah. They didn't believe Jeremiah. They didn't believe Ezekiel. They didn't believe Isaiah. They rejected the word of God and therefore they rejected Christ. If you're not convinced by the word of God, you won't be convinced by anything. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Believe in God's words and do not listen to the voice of the serpent, brothers and sisters, because if you believe in God's words, he will set your path straight. If you listen to the voice of the serpent, did God really say... It will lead you to disobedience, it will lead you to going astray, and it's always that four words, those four words which are the cause of this, did God really say? So brothers and sisters, don't just believe in Christ, believe Christ. Don't just believe in God, believe God, and he will set your path straight. Let us uh, finish in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, uh, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the eternal truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is solid and that there is no error in it, Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've given us your Holy Spirit to not just seal us for the day of redemption, but you've given us your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we don't have to, to figure out this truth for ourselves, Lord, but you've given us a great teacher, a great comforter, a great advocate, who is the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for that precious gift. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you've revealed yourself in this word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can know you intimately through the way you have spoken to us through your word. But we thank you, Lord, above all, for the one who is himself the word, the word who became flesh. We thank you for your dear son who bled and died for us. We thank you, Lord, for his sacrifice, which has made us right with you. We thank you that now we can have a living relationship with the living God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, again for all these things. We thank you for the glory and meaning of your word and we thank you Lord for the fellowship that we can enjoy as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord may you continue to teach us, may you continue to lead us and guide us Lord and strengthen us Lord in these last days. We give you praise and glory in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus.